our uh, next talk. And uh, Danielle Stoltenberg is going to talk uh, about epigenetics. And I think Zoltan gave a great presentation and, and introduced Danielle's topic really well. And her, the title of her talk is Learning to Mother, Epigenetic Mechanisms um, Drive Plasticity in the Maternal Neural Circuit. Danielle, so this year we did something very different um, from previous years in that we invited two younger faculty members to help run, uh, uh, give talks and run some of the af afternoon sessions. One is Danielle Stoltenberg, who's an assistant professor, and one is Stuart Wilson, who I think everyone met yesterday afternoon, who's also an assistant professor. And, it, and it's nice because it, 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 it gives a different perspective. Um, these are young investigators who are not much older than the students who are attending the meeting um, and who have been su uh, highly successful in, the, in their very young careers. Um, Danielle is at the University of California, Davis, and her and I have had the pleasure to recently collaborate on a, a research um, review paper, and um, I love her work. It's about epigenetics and the, and the molecular mechanisms um, that uh, allow the brain to change um, in early <laughs> development. And, uh, like I said, Zoltan talked about that a little bit. So Danielle did her PhD at Boston College. Um, she did a postdoc at University of Virginia, Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Genetics. And she just got hired at UC Davis um, as an assistant professor in 2013. So I think that's a good introduction. And one thing I'm going to, um, when people ask questions, I'm going to really, really try to remember to, for them to speak into the microphone, because then everybody can hear it and they're recording this. So if I don't, remind me. OK, Danielle, thanks. Thank you, Leah, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you so much for having me here. I'm very excited to be here. It's a great honor to speak um, uh, alongside of so many outstanding scientists. Um, so I'd like to start with perhaps a bold statement. Mothers are made. Um, and it, it seems as though mothering is quite innate, considering that for the majority of mammals, the onset of mothering behaviors coincides with the birth of offspring. Um, but one of the things that I want to talk about today is how uh, females actually transition into motherhood. And so for many mammalian um, mothers, uh, prior to uh, reproducing, they're actually hostile um, or even avoid infant stimuli. And it's only after they've reproduced themselves that they start to care for infants. Um, and one of the things that allows uh, this process to occur is the initial experience of interacting with the young. And so these initial experiences help to form uh, a mother-infant bond, and that bond really sustains um, maternal care for long periods of time. Um, for me, I got interested in maternal behavior, and I find it quite fascinating because of this dramatic change uh, in maternal responsiveness or in uh, uh, motivation to care for young that occurs <coughs> around the time of birth, and the fact that this change is then sustained for such a long period of time. And so, um, over the last several decades, there's been abundant research in this field, um, primarily uh, done with rodent species. And so we know quite a bit about uh, the neural mechanisms that underlie this change. Um, and uh, uh, I'll start by talking about um, how one of the major ways that this transition takes place, uh, which is through hormonal exposure. And so what I'm showing you here is uh, gestational hormones fluctuating um, during the 22-day gestational period of a rat. But I'll make the point that these horm these, uh, this pattern of hormonal changes, so this uh, increase and then drop in progesterone uh, alongside of this rise in estradiol, this is sort of the combination that occurs uh, in many mammals. And it's really the hormonal changes that occur right around the time of birth. So these high levels of estradiol coupled with this drop in progesterone that function to facilitate um, this bond that's formed between um, mother and infant. So while the female is exposed to uh, these hormonal changes for this long period of time, again, it's really these changes that occur right at the end of pregnancy. Um, and of course, this functions to synchronize the onset of care uh, with birth. But it's really um, not these hormonal changes that are required. Uh, we know this even in rodent species. It's really the experience of interacting with infants that's required for this bond to form. Um, and these gestational hormones uh, wane very quickly postpartum. And so again, the experience of interacting with infants is really what helps the mother to transition uh, into motherhood and to care for infants um, throughout uh, the postpartum period. 
Um, and so my research really um, is interested in focused on this experience of caring for the infants. So you're saying it's extra real than just down again after some days? So what happens is, is actually right at the time of birth, uh, females go into what's called postpartum estrus. And for rodents, this functions so that they can actually get pregnant again immediately. Um, they waste no time in that sense. After that postpartum estrus, they go into a period of lactational diestrus, and so estradiol is, is very low. Um, and then after they stop lactating, obviously they're cycling again. So um, I'd also like to say that once, once uh, mothering has occurred, once this transition into motherhood has occurred, um, females tend to always be mothers to a certain extent. Um, and so one of the greatest examples of, I think of this is, um, is the rat work where uh, prior to um, becoming a mother, uh, virgin female rats are quite avoidant um, towards pups. They actually will actively avoid infant stimuli. Um, once a female has gone through um, gestation and interacted with infants and become a mother, even if that's just for a short period of time, she'll actually continue to be much more responsive to infants for the remainder of her life, or at least as far as we've studied, so several months after um, she's had that initial experience. And so um, in other species where hormones are less um, required for maternal care, uh, it's very common to see that level of maternal motivation remains high even after weaning. Um, and so I would argue that once you have this experience, that you really have this long-lasting increase um, in maternal responsiveness. Oh, yeah. Okay, I ask this question because it's, it's, I have limited knowledge and it's distracting me. Sure. Um, the, it was my understanding that there's some older experiments that show that you can take virgin rodent females and if you just force them to be exposed to infants, then they will start showing yes. maternal behavior. And you can even take castrated males and Absolutely. Yes. do the it, same. It's an excellent thing. point. Um, and uh, you're, you're completely on the right track. So um, I, I've actually done some of that work myself. And so hormones are not required. Um, and that's one of the reasons why my research is really focused on experience. And as you'll see, I actually don't use postpartum mothers for the majority of my work. I actually use virgins. Um, but that being said, I always like to sort of make the point that hormones facilitate mother-infant bonding in all mammalian species. So um, even, for example, in humans, where hormones are clearly not required, so we obviously we have fathers that don't experience those gestational changes, and females can certainly adopt infants. Um, this pattern of hormones that fluctuate, it's actually been shown that the, more, the, the, the greater the ratio of, of estradiol to progesterone, so the higher estradiol and the lower the progesterone, that magic combination, is actually correlated with um, mother-infant bonding um, and how bonded they are. So hormones are always playing a facilitor, facilitory role, but they're not required. Um, and the, the virgin rat work speaks to that. Yes? Mm. Hi. One more question, but oxytocin, isn't it also supposed to um, enha enhance this uh, mother bond, if I'm yes, not mistaken. I and even in virgin rats, if they uh, administer oxytocin, they actually uh, become more, uh, let's say, like they have a more motherly behavior. Yes, so oxytocin is important, and I'll show you some data on oxytocin that I have later. I tend not to describe oxytocin when I talk about these hormonal changes for two main reasons. One, um, here, you know, we're, we're looking at sort of steroid fluctuating hormones. But second is that oxytocin really doesn't do anything by itself. It always needs prior estradiol. So if you take a virgin rat um, and you ovaryectomize her, for example, so she doesn't have any circulating levels of estradiol, you can still get her to, to show maternal responsiveness after several days of cohabitation cohabit with infants. Um, but if you give her an injection of oxytocin, it won't change anything because she's ovaryectomized. Now, if you give her an injection of estradiol and an injection of oxytocin, then you can. Um, and I, I can explain the mechanism behind that when I get to that part of the talk. But, um, but that's an excellent point. So oxytocin is definitely playing a role. Um, and I'm more interested in the role that it's playing uh, when it's synthesized directly in the brain rather than when it's circulating in the periphery, as it would um, at the time of birth when, when it's um, released due to vaginocervical stimulation. So, um, so there's this long-lasting change in maternal responsiveness, as I said, that lasts for a really long time. And obviously, as we've been talking about, these things are hormone independent, really. Um, and, and I'll point out that the long-lasting change can even happen in virgin rats. So it seems 
um, to me and to many other great thinkers in the field that um, this initial experience, particularly when it's in the context of um, these hormonal changes, uh, results in sort of a maternal learning, consolidation of these early maternal experiences. Um, and that uh, what we see uh, long periods of time later is actually representative of a maternal memory. And some additional evidence to this point is that if you um, remove pups from the, from the female shortly after birth, so if you give her as little as 15 minutes of interaction with infants, but then you take those infants away, you actually will still see um, increases in responsiveness towards infant stimuli for long periods um, after. And so it, it's really these initial experiences that seem to be consolidated uh, and lead to this, this memory. This, so, <laughs> um, so you seem to make a very strict dis the distinction between hormonal and uh, experiential. But experience as such will impact hormonal systems as well. So can you really have such a very binary, if you want, mm -hmm. distinction between the two? Is that really appropriate? I think that that's a great point. Um, and the reason that I make the distinction um, is when I'm talking about hormones, I'm really talking about these fluctuations in steroid hormones. And from what um, from my work and from the work that's been done in rats, there are no experienced induced changes in hormone fluctuation. So if you look, um, so I mean, you can, you can actually measure hormones at, as females are interacting with infants, but you can also do things like ovariectomize them so that they don't have any circulating hormones and then compare them to animals that do have circulating hormones. Um, and in my mouse work, which you won't see this graph, but you'll see some mouse work, I've actually used animals that are incapable of synthesizing estradiol, so aromatase knockout mice, and these animals still show all of the same experience effects that I see um, in, in uh, cycling females. And so uh, the, the only thing that hasn't been done that I would like to do um, is see whether or not there's local synthesis of estradiol in the brain, which can happen. Um, and, and I would say that it's clearly not required because of, based on the aromatase knockout data, but I, you know, I don't know if, if, if it's if it's there and if it could be potentiating the behavior in some way. So that's a great point. So um, a, as we've sort of already now been discussing, which is great, um, I'm interested in experience. Um, and particularly, I'm interested in, in experience because um, for one, we know that hormones are only playing this facilitatory role. But I'm also interested in the fact that, um, although I don't work with humans, that humans don't require any hormone changes. And I think it's really interesting to me from sort of an evolutionary standpoint um, that we've sort of evolved to become hormone independent when it comes to caring for infants. And so um, the work that I have done uh, looking at experience, I've actually used a mouse model um, to look at, and, and we'll see that in a second. But before I get too far, um, I, I just want to talk about, I've been sort of alluding to this idea that there are all these caregiving behaviors <coughs> and they last for long periods of time. I just want to define what I'm talking about. So um, mothers ensure survival. That's actually the, the definition of maternal behavior. Um, or parental behavior, um, for that matter. And there's obviously different ways that mothers can ensure survival across species. Obviously, maternal behavior is a defining characteristic of mammalian behavior, so we see lots of different mammalian mothers. Um, and it, while there are clearly differences between species, I would argue there's some overlapping categories that I'd like to point out. So one is this infant transport behavior. Um, and this is uh, particularly important in species where the young are born altricial and they're not capable of walking, locomoting at all on their own. And so we see here this um, mouse uh, carrying a pup in its mouth, transporting it from one location to another. We call this pup retrieval. Um, I would argue that this happens in other species like humans as well. Um, we carry babies around um, and they can't get from place to place on their own. And obviously this is important for um, ensuring that the infant is safe and that the infant um, in rodents, that the infant can be warm, that the infant can be fed, it's safe from predators, et cetera. Um, if you're familiar at all with maternal care and epigenetics, you might be familiar with this licking and grooming behavior. You might have heard of it from Michael Meany and Francis Champagne's work. Um, but this behavior actually, we, for a long time, that we thought that its only function was really to um, express feces <coughs> in urine, which infants are not able to do. Um, and then, of course, the mom is able to regain some water um, by this anogenital licking. But we now know that this is impo a, an important tactile uh, stimulation um, and that this provides um, really uh, some, some sort of trait of information about the environment that allows infants to, uh, uh, to display different types of emotionality as adults. So 
whether they're super stress responsive or less stress responsive can be associated with how much their mothers licked and groomed them. Um, and of course, humans don't display licking and grooming, but I would argue that it's, again, the, the basis of this is really a tactile input, tactile stimulation. Um, and then of course, mothers provide milk um, for their infants and, and keep them warm. And they do these behaviors for a really long period of time, as I've already said. What I find so fascinating about this is that the, the energetic demand to be a mother are very high. Um, and oftentimes, in order to protect your infants, you have to sort of risk your own life. For rats, the only time that a female rat will ever show an aggressive response is when she's lactating and taking care of her young. And so um, it's, it's been particularly interesting to me that this change lasts for so long and that mothers are still motivated to care for their young for um, it, even after the time that they've weaned their offspring. And so the central question of my research, again, has really been to understand how this bond is formed, how it maintains um, these high levels of care for long periods of time. Um, and this is really what led me to the question of epigenetics. So when I was thinking about how I would introduce it to you, I was looking for a funny cartoon, and I found this, which made me laugh, and I thought, um, you know, if they ask you anything you don't know, just say it's due to epigenetics. I don't think that strategy is going to work for this talk. <laughs> But, um, but what I like about it is that it sort of illustrates the elusive nature of this word epigenetics. And um, it's, it, it's very elusive, I think, because it's a word with many different meanings and many different associations. And so I'm going to try to introduce it to you in the next um, couple of slides and then sort of describe how I got involved in it. So we can't really talk about epigenetics without talking about genetics. Um, and so when we, um, when we got this beautiful structure of, of DNA, this double helical structure from Watson and Crick in the 1950s, we were told that, that DNA is, uh, contains the instructions for life. We were given this metaphor. Um, and shortly after, um, Crick proposed in the 70s um, the central dogma, which I think really has been extremely influential in the way that we think about genes and gene expression. And the central dogma is very simple, um, really. Uh, Crick says that we have DNA, which is transcribed into RNA, um, and we got a great int introduction of those things from Zoltan. Um, and then this RNA then becomes protein, um, and this process, of course, is gene expression, and then our proteins affect behavior. Um, and so um, I think inherent in this central dogma is the idea that we go directly from DNA or from genes to behavior. Um, or to phenotype, and so it seems as though from, from this central dogma there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between genotype and phenotype, and um, I don't think I need to convince anyone in this room that that can be problematic. Uh, and so Conrad Waddington, even before we knew the structure of DNA, um, was already thinking that this was kind of a naive assumption, that you can't really say that there's this direct association or correlation between um, genotype and phenotype, and so he proposed in 1942, um, he proposed that we, we really need to get away from this thinking. Um, and he, what he said directly is, we certainly need to remember that between genotype and phenotype and connecting them to each other, there lies a whole complex of developmental processes. It is convenient to have a name for this complex, the epigenotype. And uh, in, in his paper, The Epigenotype, what he's actually saying is, you know, we need to pay attention to what these processes are and we need to causally uh, determine the mechanisms that are regulating these processes. Um, of course, unfortunately for Waddington, um, these ideas really were not um, predominant. Instead, we continued to explore the genome and focus on the genome and focus on genetics um, for several years. And I think when um, the Human Genome Project was finished, um, and you know, we didn't get all the answers that we hoped for. So now we know the entire code. We have all the instructions, but we still don't understand um, really how life is built. I think Watson kind of said it best, that we've entered into a post-genomic era. And so he says, you can inherit something that's beyond the DNA sequence, and that's where the real excitement in genetics is now. So if you don't believe that in ep epigenetics is this exciting new field, um, I would say take it from Watson himself. Um, I'm not going to actually talk about heritability today, but if you, you know, if you have questions about that idea, um, feel free to interrupt me. So what I thought I would do um, is I thought I would try to create a new metaphor for us to understand 
um, exactly what, what we're talking about when we talk about epigenetics and how this relates to our ideas about genetics. Um, and I think one of the issues is when we think about DNA as being these instructions for life, inherent in the idea of instructions is that they would automatically be played out, that we would have these instructions and that um, these instructions would sort of be automatically followed. And so I don't think that it's a bad metaphor, but I think that sometimes it leads to some confused thinking about how genes work. And so instead, um, I propose this idea that maybe we could think about genetics in a more basic way. And so maybe we can think about genes and DNA as notes comprising a, a language of music. And without these notes, music might not exist. But of course, the notes themselves don't just make music. And so um, instead, we need some sort of pattern, some sort of timing, some sort of rhythm, some sort of meaning of these notes. And so um, perhaps we can think about epigenetics then as, as exactly this, a, a pattern, a meaning, a timing, putting those notes um, together, making a song. And so maybe this code then would be brought to life by this conductor, this epigenetic conductor, if you will. Um, and I, you know, to me, this makes a lot of sense because I think another very simple way to talk about epigenetics is to say that we're talking about really the control of DNA readout. We're talking about the control of gene expression. Do you want to discuss this metaphor, or are you just like to just Yeah, you can. We can discuss it. I just made it up myself, so maybe there's holes in it. I don't know. <laughs> You do. Oh, completely. <laughs> <laughs> well, sure, but that's why I said. Look, we can, we can, we can talk about it later if you want, right? Because <laughs> no, no, you, let's talk about what it. What you're depicting here is re is reflecting the Western musical tradition, and the Western musical tradition is very much top-down orchestrated, mm -hmm. right? So it's all done by external instruction. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what epigenetics is not about, because there mm -hmm. you really talk about the self-organization of patterns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly the opposite. Well, this I is think the metaphor I metaphor that you do not want to support. I, I think that I, I try to fit both ideas in, right? So there's somebody who put these music notes together, the musician, and then there's the conductor sort of bringing it to life. No, you don't like that. Okay. It's like, it just <laughs> seems like you're replacing the genetic instructions with the conductor. So it's actually basically you're just changing the word for the same problematic metaphor. Let's go deeper than that because the notes are produced by a single human genius composer. This is codified. Mm -hmm. It is executed by musicians as automata. They are just following the instructions right. that are defined by an external intelligence agent, right. controlled by another external intelligence agent. Right. So this is exactly not what epigenetics can be about. Right, right. I, I agree. No, I agree with that. I agree with that point. I agree with that point. Well, somebody needs to write a metaphor. Apparently, it's not me. I, 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 think, I think there's something going on Does here. Does anybody have yeah. a metaphor else? Yeah, so, I, I mean, it doesn't have to be Western music, but uh, <laughs> going back to what you said about you know, DNA building proteins, and the proteins are like the notes. It's, it's what, that's what you're saying, essentially, isn't it? That you have this uh, limited uh, number of fundamental things that you can generate through the genome, and that you can code it accurately for these different notes, and then you can assemble music out of them. And we have scales, we have different scales of right, music, right. different mm -hmm. kinds of music. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, yes. the genome fundamentally constrains what you can do. Because yes. there's only yes, yes. a mm -hmm. limited number, mm -hmm. I don't know how many millions or thousands of, of proteins you can make, and that's your language then from which you build a, a body. Yes, yes, yes. I agree with that, although I don't know if I would say proteins, I, I would maybe say, you know, because you, you can clearly create um, you know, I mean, you can have some level of regulation before you get to the protein level. Yeah. But, but yes, yes, I think that's kind of the. And I think the where point. maybe it breaks down is is that with regulatory genes, genes switch on other genes. Right. And so, the notes are doing much more. In terms okay, Tony. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're moving on from the. Moving metaphor. on. Okay. So, like I said, <laughs> clearly. There is a job for you guys out there. Somebody is going to write a better metaphor. Okay, so let's just move to the things I do know about, which is the definitions. 
Um, so here's the definition. Here's my favorite definition. There are, uh, there are certainly a couple of definitions, but I think this is sort of the most basic definition of epigenetics. So this refers to stable changes in gene expression without changes to the DNA sequence. Okay? And so really what we're, what, what we're going to look at in the next slide and how this happens is we're really thinking about how DNA is packaged within the nucleus. So we have all of this genetic information and we need to get it into this very tiny nucleus. And so in order to do that, um, we don't just have DNA uh, in, in contained in our chromatin, um, but we also have these histone proteins, these optimers of proteins, um, which uh, the DNA is uh, supercoiled around. And so we have this supercoiling, and then we have this compaction into chromosomes, and then, of course, this is all fitting into the nucleus. And so as it turns out, the way that the uh, chromosomes are packaged within the nucleus can affect how um, genes are, are transcribed and how they're expressed, rather. So, um, I'll, this, so this is my sort of cartoon to um, help all of you uh, conceptualize and visualize this. And I think it's, it's a kind of a basic idea. So you want to think about the fact that in order for a gene to be turned on or to be expressed, you need to assemble transcriptional machinery at the promoter of that gene. Um, and in order to do this, you need some space because you've got a lot of molecules in there. And so the way that chromatin is um, positioned within, uh, within the nucleus then can affect this process. So when we have a closed chromatin state, um, we have a, a difficult time getting genes to be turned on, as indicated by this red arrow. And so what we're looking for are these epigenetic marks then that can alter, sometimes alter the structure of the chromatin um, and therefore allow <laughs> Uh, genes to be turned on. And these marks can, um, can be found on the, the tails of the histone. So this is our optimer, and we have protruding here these histone tails. So we can find marks there. We can also find marks directly on the DNA, um, and these would be on the cytosine residues. And um, depending on which marks we have, um, we might be able to get an open chromatin configuration um, which would allow for access of transcription machinery uh, and gene expression to be turned on. And so uh, which marks you have um, can influence whether the chromatin is in this closed state or whether the chromatin is in this open state, um, and this can impact whether or not a gene can be transcribed. And obviously there's different levels of this. So we can have um, really uh, complete silencing, for example, as would occur in a neuron, um, when we're talking about genes that would code for liver enzymes, right? So we're not going to get any liver enzymes being expressed in a neuron. Um, but we can also have more subtle marks um, that can be actively induced by the environment. Um, and I'm going to show you, um, really just using my own research, how I think that process is, is playing out. Um, and so what I think is kind of interesting about this and, and um, what I think definitely the metaphor does not speak to um, is this idea that these epigenetic marks um, are playing an important role in development. They are sort of inherently there, but that um, they can be influenced by the environment because intracellular signaling cascades and activity-dependent changes can influence those marks that are already laid down and modify those marks. Yeah. Can I ask, uh, sure. Question? Close versus open, is it always binary like that? Or can you no, have marks where it's kind of <laughs> partly open and therefore you get a limited amount of gene expression? Yes, yes. So um, this is, as I said, this is a really sort of simple introduction to this, um, this idea. And it's, um, sometimes it can be very closed and very compacted. But more often when, you know, there's the sorts of questions that I'm interested in, you're looking at experience dependent changes. You're looking at really subtle changes that are influencing the amount of a gene that's being expressed um, and not necessarily completely silencing it or repressing it. Um, the, the meaning of the marks is, I think, a huge area of research right now. And some marks are very clear, and other marks are a, li a bit more elusive um, in terms of whether they, they are um, meaning that the chromatin is going to be open or that it's going to be an increase in gene expression versus uh, transcriptional repression. Um, the uh, most sort of uh, probably well understood concept is the concept of DNA methylation in which um, gene expression is inhibited. Um, but my work will mostly focus on histone acetylation, um, which is a little bit different, but you'll see in a moment. A signal of a transcriptional history? I'm not sure what you mean. Well, 
Well, like I said, I think some of the marks we're just not sure about. Um, and other marks, I think it's very clear. Um, and the marks also come on and off. So the marks can be stable, but they can also be dynamic. So um, it's just, it's not, it's not as clear for every single mark. You say it's a substrate that could be like an epigenetic system mechanism, but won't be itself if you don't know what it is. Yes, yes. So um, because these epigenetic marks can, um, as I said, can be influenced by experiences um, that an animal might have, um, this is sort of what led me into the field of epigenetics and, and to sort of take an epigenetic approach to my understanding of how the experience of becoming a mother modifies subsequent behavior and for long periods of time. Um, and so I, I divided my talk into three parts. The first um, part is certainly the most um, developed, but the second two parts are new and kind of exciting and I wanted to um, show you where the lab is headed. So the first part um, is gonna be focused on uh, using a laboratory mouse as a model of maternal learning. Um, and as I said um, earlier, uh, you might be familiar with epigenetics and maternal care from the Michael Meany and Francis Champagne work, which is beautiful, um, but really focused on how the mother acts as uh, a mediator for these epigenetic changes in the offspring. But again, I, I just want to highlight that I'm really interested in the mother's experience. Um, and I, I do look at it from a developmental standpoint, but it's sort of a developmental um, event that occurs in adulthood as a robust change um, in the adult life of, of female mammals. So um, I'll start with my mouse work. So why mice? Um, I'll, I'll address this question because I know that mice are a highly artificial model um, and sometimes there's questions about why we use mice as opposed to rats, for example, that show really beautiful behavior and most of what we know about neural circuits regulating maternal care has all been done um, in rats, but mice have some, some interesting, important features that I think make them an excellent model for looking at maternal learning. The first is that, um, particularly because I'm interested in epigenetics, I work with inbred, inbred strains of mice, which are genetically identical. So all of the animals um, and the work that I'll show you, these animals are essentially clones of one another, and that's one of the reasons why people are interested in working with mice in terms of genetics in general. Um, but secondly, something kind of interesting and strange has happened in laboratory strains of mice, which is that they started to show this spontaneous maternal care. So um, as was brought up earlier, rats will show maternal care, but you have to habituate them with infants for like days and days and days. Mice, on the other hand, only laboratory mice, mus musculus, not, certainly not your house mouse, but laboratory strains of mice will actually respond to infants within 15 minutes of being exposed to them. Um, which is really, to me, quite fascinating. Um, and this has, regardless, this, this is regardless of their prior hormone exposure, so whether they were mothers, whether they've ever been mothers, whether they've ever been exposed to estradiol, um, and this is regardless of whether they've ever experienced infants before. Um, so they're pretty sp spontaneously maternal. Um, but what's interesting about this spontaneous maternal behavior is that they show dramatic changes in how well they care for infants. So they, they respond to them quite quickly, but they're not very motivated to interact with them right off the bat. However, they change in terms of their motivation um, after several experiences. And so I think that makes them a nice model for learning. Um, and then secondly, I work with mice because of the availability of tra conditional transgenic animals. It really allows us to manipulate, um, and you'll see some of this work, manipulate gene expression in vivo in a non-invasive way. Um, and so I think that that's kind of nice. So um, I said that females are not very motivated to interact with infants, um, although they would spontaneously respond to them in their, in their um, home cage. So I want to show you a video of what I'm talking about and how I measure maternal learning in, in these um, C57 black six mice. And so what I'll show you here, um, and, and I'll make the point before I show these videos, these are really for demonstration purposes. So um, we don't actually videotape this, and we do all of our testing in the dark under red light um, because that's their active phase. But what I'm going to show you here is I'm going to show you an animal that has um, pup experience, and I'm putting her into this novel environment that she's never been in before. And so this is, mice are quite neophobic, and so this is sort of an anxiety-producing scenario. She's been habituated, so what I've kind of decided is that perhaps these animals 
um, with subthreshold experience, they're not done consolidating their memory. We might actually be seeing an increase in um, oxytocin in these guys as compared with um, the animals with the HDEC inhibitor, but um, not entirely sure. So, uh, so we see some of these genes that, are, that do remain high for one month after this experience. So to address the question of what's going on during the actual consolidation, what genes are involved at that time point, um, I'll show you this uh, small piece of data. So each one of these experiences is separated by um, a 24-hour period. And so the question is, um, what happens in this 24-hour period right before we put the animals on the maze in terms of gene expression? And so I took a couple of different time points and did sort of a time course study. And um, I'll just show you here what I found with CBP, or crab binding protein, because I think it's kind of interesting. So what we see is when we look, um, if you look at the sort of the pattern across these time points in animals with this subthreshold experience, you see that there is a bit of an increase at 30 minutes, but that that CBP expression wanes. And this is sort of what I was talking about before when I said forgetting is the default. I think that there probably is an initial increase in CBP, but that it sort of drops off. On the other hand, when we look at animals with um, that received the HDAC inhibitor, you can see that we got an increase um, that's even higher than animals uh, with subthreshold experience alone at 30 minutes. Everybody drops down at five hours, but then 24 hours later, we get this peak in um, expression of CBP again. And so um, it seems to me uh, two things. One is that probably we're getting some, some uh, downstream effects of this first wave um, on the second wave and that something about these peaks might be involved in, in um, the behavior that we see on the maze. But secondly, um, it was striking to me that there were no changes at five hours. And so I wondered if these gene expression changes are really so tightly linked to the behaviors that we see, um, what if I put the animals on the maze at five hours when we don't see any changes in, in gene expression, um, what would happen to their behavior at that point? And so um, if we look at estrogen, I'll just add that it's not only um, CBP that isn't upregulated at five hours. Es there's no change in estrogen receptor beta, and there's also no change in oxytocin. Um, and so when we put these animals onto the maze, interestingly enough, even though they just had pup experience a few hours before, we don't see any differences on the T maze um, in terms of the number of pup pups retrieved or the latency to retrieve pups. And you can see 15 minutes is the cutoff, so really most of these animals didn't retrieve pups at all. So, um, to me, this indicated that the gene expression changes that we see probably are um, associated with the behavior that we're seeing on the maze at that time. Yeah, where's Bagel and how many mice? Um, oops, sorry. Uh, this data is, um, I believe, five and six. Okay. So this, is, this, this was not part of the other studies that you've seen. So this was a, a sort of a pilot that I did. The statistical power of this is low. So we should, we should take it with a grain of salt. You would agree? I would agree. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. OK, so um, following up on, um, on this idea of maintenance of gene expression one month later, um, I also wanted to ask about whether or not um, my hypothesis might be supported um, with this idea that CBP is recruited um, and is involved in um, perhaps consolidating um, these maternal memories and affecting gene expression um, at, at the time of this initial uh, learning experience. And so for this experiment, um, I did a chip analysis. This is a chromatin immunoprecipitation. And the way that these experiments work is that essentially you're asking about whether or not you have a particular protein that is in the promoter region of a particular gene. And so you're doing an immunoprecipitation um, to pull out the uh, protein that has been cross-linked to the DNA. And then you're going to follow this up by doing a quantitative uh, real-time PCR to look at expression of the gene. Um, and so I, I did this uh, um, with CBP. So I actually haven't looked at the acetyl marks yet. But I started by looking at CBP and asked the question of whether or not it was in the promoter region of estrogen receptor beta. So um, for this experiment, I actually included a couple different groups. So the naive group that I told you about before that wouldn't respond to pups at all, um, and the naive group that got an HDAC inhibitor that also wouldn't respond to pups at all. 
and then the subthreshold group, which you've now seen several slides of. And so all three of these groups, let me add, would not be responsive to PUPs on the maze. Um, and so what we see here is that the only group that shows, um, and this is fold change to the naive group, the only group that shows a significant increase in recruitment of CBP to the estrogen receptor beta promoter is um, this group that got the subthreshold experience with the HDAC inhibitor. So it seems as though um, these changes in CBP are um, probably associated with turning on estrogen receptor beta. Interestingly enough, estrogen receptor beta um, actually regulates the expression of oxytocin. Estrogen receptor alpha regulates the expression of oxytocin receptor. So it was kind of nice that I only saw changes in estrogen receptor beta and oxytocin, but not estrogen receptor alpha and oxytocin receptor, um, suggesting that maybe ER beta is regulating the oxytocin gene, but I haven't run that chip um, at this point. Could, could you have done experiments where you added some RNA inhibitor for the CBP to see if, how specific that is? Um, RNA inhibitor for the CBP? Well, to, well or so, to, sil you know, to silence the protein at that point. I think, so uh, what you're getting at, I think, is what I want to do with my transgenic mice. So I'll show you that slide in a minute. Um, but I mean, here you're, you're um, I, I feel like you would have to somehow do that when the animal was still alive. Beforehand, is that what you mean, or you're saying in the actual tissue sample? Uh, well, you could do that in the mice. There's, there's, there's some studies where people where you can mm -hmm. you could change the RNA production of the CBP if it's that dynamic, such that you're suppressing that protein at the time point that you would expect it would be yes. functional. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. And I I think that that would be good to do. Um, so uh, so to address kind of Scott what you're saying here, um, the question of whether or not um, CBP is really necessary. What I've actually been um, working on is using um, these, my, these tra conditional transgenic animals. And so I'll just note a little bit about the CBP gene. As I've alluded to earlier, it has these two domains. So one of these domains um, is involved in, uh, in Cre when Kreb recruits CBP um, and is involved with binding to Kreb. The other domain is the HAT domain that I've already told you about, this histone acetyltransferase domain. So what happens is, what can be problematic, is if you knock out the CBP gene, um, first of all, CBP is involved in a ton of things. And if you knock it out, um, if you do a double knockout of it, it's lethal. So, um, but even if you were, even if you knock out just part of it, you're still not really getting at this question of whether or not it's CBP's role as a histone acetyltransferase um, or it's CBP's role um, in terms of CREB. Because CREB cannot turn on gene expression, really, without CBP. So, um, there's a, so um, I have a collaborator uh, at UC Riverside, Ed Corzis, who published this paper in 2004, um, which really showed that um, it's the histone acetyltransferase domain of CBP that's required for learning and memory consolidation. Um, and he did this by creating a, a transgenic conditional mouse where only HAT, the HAT domain of CBP, is knocked out. Um, and these mice are, are on a C57 background, which is what I already work with, so it's great. And this is a, a doxycycline um, system. And so all you have to do is feed these animals. So I think I have a little cartoon of this. Um, I don't. You feed these animals uh, a doxycycline diet, and it keeps the transgene um, inactive. When you want to manipulate the transgene, you just remove the diet, and the transgene becomes expressed. And when the transgene is expressed, it codes for a protein that doesn't have this um, histone acetyltransferase capability. And so you can really dynamically control histone acetyltransferase activity as mediated by CBP. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have a, a lot of data with these animals because um, I got them during my postdoc, right when I finished. Um, and this, I, I literally was collecting, I believe I was collecting these data while I was um, packing the moving van. And <laughs> I haven't been able to, um, I haven't been able to start my colony yet uh, ne uh, at UC Davis. And so um, unfortunately, this, these, this is a really small N, and this is just all I have at the moment. But I think we can see some trends towards what's happening when we affect um, HAT activity. So when we turn HAT off during these four um, two-hour exposures, uh, first of all, I think it's really interesting what happens in the home cage. So most animals, this is latency to retrieve all pups in the home cage. Most virgin uh, female mice uh, 
take a little while to gather the cups on the first day, but by their fourth experience, they're really fast. Um, and what we see here with the mutants is the complete opposite. They just sort of flatline, um, and they don't show any changes in their, um, as depicted by this graph, in their speed of retrieving and gathering the pups, which really is pretty um, unusual. When we look at them on the T maze, again, this is really preliminary here, but um, what we see is that uh, these mutant animals uh, significant, or uh, not, this isn't significant yet, but hopefully could be, uh, they seem to be retrieving less on the maze. And so um, to me, this indicates that perhaps uh, CBP hat mediated activity is required. Um, and of course, we don't know in terms of gene expression what would happen, but this, these, this is the model that I would like to use to look at um, what happens in terms of gene expression in the MPOA when you knock out um, the hat activities of CBP. So um, I'll just summarize the, the first part um, by saying that uh, if we globally increase histone acetylation in the brain by administering these HDAC inhibitors, um, we can potentiate maternal learning um, and, le and lead to the formation of these long-lasting maternal memories in non-pregnant mice. Um, and the mechanism uh, through which HDAC inhibitor facilitates maternal, maternal learning um, may involve an increased uh, expression of just a subset of genes in the medial preoptic area. And this might be regulated by the recruitment of CBP um, during that consolidation of the learning experience. And then finally, if we inhibit uh, histone acetyltransferase activity of CBP specifically, we can disrupt maternal learning. At least we know for sure in the home cage that these animals really just aren't able to, um, to learn how to retrieve pups. So and do I have any, any questions before I go there? Go on. Okay. okay, so um, now I'll, I'll move on to um, sort of the new data that I've been collecting. And so this is, these are um, very, very preliminary data, but um, they were exciting enough to sort of tell you guys about. So um, the, part, the second part of my talk um, is really looking now at fathers. So why um, do people not look at fathers in mice? Well, because mice aren't biparental. Mus musculus are not biparental. And so um, for you know, a long time, most of the work that's been done on parental care is focused on females um, because over 95% of all mammalian species are uniparental and it's the mother that's showing all the care. But considering how artificial this laboratory mouse model is, um, it might not surprise you that male mice will also spontaneously respond to pups um, in the laboratory. And so I thought this might be an interesting opportunity to just ask the question of whether or not some of the same um, mechanisms might underlie their responsiveness, whether they can respond at all to a level that's similar to females. Um, and especially considering that I've worked out now some mechanisms that may be involved in how maternal learning is consolidated, we can sort of ask whether these same things might be involved in the males. And so I've just started to, um, to look at these animals. Um, and I've done these experiments in the same way um, that I've done the, the female experiments. So we give these animals this HDAC inhibitor um, and we administer this to naive virgin males. We spread the pups out in the cage. We give them some experience with the animals and then we ask how they respond in their home cage and how they respond um, in the T maze, which I believe is the next slide. And so first I want to point out that males are, are um, certainly not like females, um, perhaps not surprisingly. And, and again, let me note that these are virgin males. So these are not animals that have had any sexual experience. Um, and generally in the population of laboratory mice, what you see is that usually some virgin males will respond to infants. Some of them will cannibalize if they're intact. If you castrate um, virgin males, you'll see that everybody will be responsive to infants. Um, and I've done some of those experiments before. And actually, if you castrate virgin males and you ovarectomize virgin females and you um, study them side by side, you see actually very few differences between the two. Um, but here, these animals are intact. And I actually have seen um, so far no, no experiences of cannibalism, which I do think is a little unusual in this particular um, C57 strain of mouse, but that's what I'm seeing so far. Um, but we don't see uh, exactly the same patterns that we would see in females. And what I would argue is really that males just probably require more experience to show the same effects. So when we look at their latency to retrieve, 
pups um, in the home cage, we see that, so first of all, if we just look at animals that were treated with water, again, we see this pattern that's very consistent um, across most of the mice that I've tested, which is that they uh, take a long time on the first day, but that they really rapidly change. And this is just looking at test days one and two. Um, what's interesting is if you look at animals that were treated with the H2 inhibitor, we're already seeing some differences even on the first test day. So these pups, they seem to respond faster to the pups on the first test day um, compared with animals that were treated with water. What's interesting to me is that if you look at the amount of time that they spend with the pups during that two hour period, it's actually uh, doesn't seem to be different between these two groups of animals. And so, um, although it's probably very different from a female, so I didn't directly do a, a comparison in this particular study, but what we see here, um, it isn't typical of what you'd see for females. So females usually spend most of their time interacting with pups. Um, so to me, that was kind of interesting. So now when we look, um, when we look on the maze, what we see, is um, again, there seems to be some sort of an effect, a facilitatory effect of HDAC um, inhibitor. And this was a fairly strong effect, although this is an N of three, so it's very low um, in the HDAC inhibitor group. Um, but uh, again, compared with um, animals that are uh, treated with water, we see uh, no pup retrieval. Now what's interesting about this is that unlike females, these, these animals needed four days of experience um, in order to show uh, to show this effect on the maze with the h tech inhibitor, unlike the females, which only required two days. So they might need a little bit more experience, but at least it seems like there's a trend towards them responding to the same sort of manipulation that we see in the virgin female mice. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you explain the, the fact that already at the first uh, day, <coughs> the h deck group shows uh, more rapid retrieval because what you're manipulating is memory consolidation. So you could argue, well, for the retrieval task, mm -hmm. we are in a time window in which it shows a long-term um, consolidation mm -hmm. of memory relay. Yeah, no, I, I do. I agree with you. I think that there might be there might be more than one process that's involved. So it could be uh, sort of an immediate increase in attractive qualities of the pups, um, which is definitely what we see with hormones in rats. Um, and then it could be once they're, so in other words, sort of increasing their uh, approach towards the pups from a, a distal place um, to, because really what you see when they're not responding in the, in the water group um, is unlike the females, they just sort of completely ignore the pups. Mm. Um, and then it might be that once they're close enough to the pups, they're getting some proximal stimuli, that is what's actually consolidated. Clearly, they need some experience with them um, in order to respond on the maze, and more so than what we see for the females. But, um, but yes, there might be some sort of a an increase in attractive qualities that happens right off the bat. And I'm not, I'm, I'm That's not sure. That's a result of H deck. That's a result of mm -hmm. H deck inhibitor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So I have two two questions. The first is, if this doesn't typically happen for male mice, why do they retain this? Uh, care circuitry at all. And then my second question is, I recall a study using mice, I don't know if it was a strain of mice, where they said that you could induce paternal care mm -hmm. of pups if they just cohabitate with the pregnant female. Yes, so, um, so I'll address your second question first. Um, so that is true, um, and uh, that works really interesting, and it's done with a different strain of mouse. And when you do those experiments with the C57 strain, you don't get that effect, um, which is actually not surprising to me because I haven't seen much of a difference with um, breeder males when I've put them on the maze and they've had a ton of experience, even breeder males that I see <coughs> retrieving pups in the home cage. Um, and so, uh, so to that end, I would say there's clearly strain differences in how these animals are responding. Um, the first part of your question I would argue that the circuit that's, um, that's sort of conserved and in place to care for infants um, is present in males and in females, but that, again, it's probably not accessed in males. It's not accessible in males. Something about these laboratory um, conditions make these animals much less avoidant or fearful or um, aggressive towards the pups because we don't see this cannibalism. Um, and so, therefore, they're, a lot, they're getting a little bit closer to pups. And so, again, this sort of um, distal to, to eventually proximal stimuli might be somehow inducing this circuit. Um, so it's not, 
that it needs to happen because it doesn't need to happen in these conditions. It's just that it can happen because they're not cannibalizing the pup. They're actually spending some time with it. And well, so that stimuli sort of turns on the circuit. Well, this is, I'm thinking more broadly in terms of, you know, they showed, I think it was Jay Rosenblatt, they showed mm -hmm. that, you know, if you do the same thing with rats, you activate, and I think he showed with hormones and lesions of MPOA mm -hmm. that you can, that it's that circuitry seems to be involved in paternal care, care of infants that's very similar to the female care of infants. And then you're showing uh, similar data in, mm -hmm. a, in a more elegant way. But it's all pointing to these are circuits that aren't normally used in their species typical way. So why do we, why does the brain bother to construct these circuits in males? Anyway, it seems like a waste of Well, I would say it's just, cons I would say it's conserved across <coughs> mammals. So, I mean, that's sort of the way that I think about it. Um, and because some mammals are biparental. And so, um, so I would con say that it's conserved. I mean, certainly not everything that, you know, is conserved is use useful, I guess. I don't know if that's not a good answer to your question, but, um, but I would just say that it's, it's present in all mammals. Um, so at least we have the capability of, of developing it. Um, okay, so. So now um, to my final part of the, of the talk here. Um, so this is a project that, um, that I've been really excited about. It's been very, probably the most challenging logistically project that I've ever worked on, but it's been a lot of fun. Um, and I've been um, asking this question um, really, uh, what happens when you take a laboratory rat and you put it into a semi-natural environment? So I have this gone wild in quotation marks because these animals aren't really going wild. But we're sort of um, looking at these animals in an environment that's, um, that is constantly changing, much more variable, but where they're protected from predators. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second. And the reason that I wanted to do this really um, is that when we, when we ask questions about motherhood, particularly from the mother's perspective, um, all of these laboratory models, they're giving us a lot of information about mechanism and details. but they're not really addressing what happens when mothers have to respond to infants um, in dynamic and real sorts of ways. Because when we look at these animals in the laboratory, their conditions don't change. They're under sort of a, a, a chronic state. And so I said in the beginning that I think mothers are made, but I don't think that they're made in a vacuum. Um, I think that they need to respond to their infants in a dynamic and ever-changing way. Um, and I argue all the time that the experience of becoming a mother results in this sustained sensitivity, which is what I've sort of showed you here. Um, and that that sustained sensitivity is there to ensure that the mother is going to continually respond to pups and meet those sort of demands of motherhood. But I ask the question of how demanding is motherhood when we look at it in these standard laboratory conditions. I don't think that it is. And so um, this project came as a collaboration with um, a uh, scientist in uh, Leah Krubitzer's lab. And um, when I first heard about this sort of unique opportunity to put these animals um, into these field pens in this uh, nature reserve, um, I thought this was a really interesting way, not only to look at development and how um, these animals, how offspring that are born in this environment um, might change as they're developing, but also to look at how the mother responds to these sort of dynamic conditions. And so um, this is a closer up picture of the field pens. This is um, Dylan Cook, who um, I've been collaborating with on this project. Um, and he's cleaning off the top of the pens. Um, and uh, he's taken several of these, um, or he's added several of these photos here to indicate some of the um, sights and sounds and smells that our rats that are living in these field pens are exposed, excuse me, are exposed to. Um, and this is a picture that I took that sort of gives you, I think, a little bit of, an, uh, of a feeling for how far um, these pens are out from any sort of building. And, and the whole thing is in a nature reserve. So, I mean, the entire area is pretty rural. Um, but uh, just to walk out to the pens, it's, it's quite a journey. Oftentimes I see when I'm going out there wild turkeys just hanging out at the front of the pen, sort of sniffing around. We're not really, you know, unfortunately, I'll show you our camera setup in a second. We can't completely tell um, what sort of animals are hanging out outside the pens, but I can promise you that 
um, just from what we've seen when we've been out there, there are quite a few. Inside the pens, um, we found uh, lizards, um, crickets, and we've seen the rats eating these things, or not the lizards, but the crickets. Um, and so these animals are definitely getting really different types of experiences than what you would see in a laboratory setting. Um, and so uh, first I'll note that the weather conditions are extremely variable. So um, I'm from California, and so these studies have been taking place over the summertime, um, which the temperatures range quite a bit. So the range is from um, 43 to 12 degrees Celsius. Um, and on average, um, I just pulled this. We actually monitor the temperature ourselves, but um, I just pulled this off the internet quickly for the time range we've had them out there. Um, so we see the average is 23.9 degrees Celsius. Um, and then humidity just is in a very large range. So every, anywhere from 4 to 100% humidity with an average of 58. Um, I will note that these animals recently experienced an earthquake uh, because we had an earthquake nearby. Uh, which I slept right through, but everyone told me that they could feel it um, in Davis. And so uh, this, uh, so, uh, you know, it was kind of funny the day that the earthquake happened, I had to note in the book, uh, under weather conditions, <laughs> earthquake. <laughs> so, um, and then they're also exposed, as I said, to all sorts of predator cues. So what we've been doing is we've transferred um, animals, uh, sprog dolly rats, a standard laboratory strain um, that have been impregnated to um, this outdoor pen, and, and this is our sort of weather protecting shield. Here's a box, and inside this box, um, they have another box, so they're sort of protected from the sun and, and from the rain, um, although they, it hasn't rained at all since they've been there because it's the summertime. Um, but uh, you'll see the inside view in a second. Um, and uh, we have, um, there's plenty of space for them to run around, they climb. Um, you can see one of our cameras right here. So we have some cameras outfitted out here to monitor them 24 hours a day. So we can see what they're doing. Um, and then we're comparing them to animals that are living under standard laboratory conditions. And it's a little different than a, comp than a standard rat cage. So what we've been using is these phenotyper boxes that are available from Noldis. Um, and they make this box where they have an infrared camera outfitted at the top. Um, looking down onto this cage, and this is their food bin and their water bin. And so it's a little bit bigger than what you would typically see um, in a standard rat cage, but probably not much bigger than a maternity-sized cage. These animals, of course, experience the standard laboratory conditions, which are completely, um, completely different than what we see in the environment. So a really, really narrow range of temperature, um, 20 to 23 degrees Celsius, and a very narrow range of humidity. So I actually built, um, I built a lot of things for this experiment. Um, and I, what I did was I just built a box that looks exactly like this, and I put it inside of our pens, our outdoor field pens. And so what you see is actually the exact same picture in both locations. So this is in the standard location. Um, these are two different litters, so this just uh, looks quite different. But um, this is what we see in the semi-natural condition. And so we're getting really a, a, the same, not only are, we're trying to match um, many of the tests that we're doing, but I also really felt like it was important to match the exact views of the animals inside of their burrow box. Um, in addition, we have some other footage of what happens when they're running around outside of their burrow box. This is a food maze that I built um, with PVC pipes. Um, they have to go, um, you can see they enter through here. Um, and then they have to forage their food through this little box um, over here. And this will sort of allow us to watch their interactions as they pass. Um, only one rat can pass through the tube at a time. Um, and then we have their water here. So um, we're, as I said, we're monitoring these animals 24 hours a day. We have tons and tons of video footage, um, which has not been um, coded yet. So this is, this is really new. We just started this experiment. Well, we actually started this experiment last year, but we finally got all of our video monitoring up just this summer. So, um, so I'll get, show you a bit of a timeline of what we're doing. So um, again, we transfer these females into their new environments um, and let them habituate before they give birth. Um, and then during the first um, po uh, two to 14 postnatal days, um, what we're doing is we're uh, conducting a series of these neurobehavioral tests. And I'll show you some of those data. 
Um, and we're also recording some developmental milestones. So when do we see their eyes open? When do they, we see their incisors erupt, erupting? Um, and things like that. And so we have to go in there um, daily and check on them. So we just try to time it at the exact same time of day for each group. Um, and we also record their temperature, their body weight, things like that. You can see that we've marked them with numbers. Ideally, um, eventually we'll be able to see these on the camera screens. Unfortunately, in the beginning, we used a food, we used a food marker so that um, the moms wouldn't be licking sort of a toxic Sharpie, but the food marker must have had some red tones in it, so it wasn't picked up by the infrared cameras. So um, now we're just switching to Sharpie marker. Um, and then as the pups grow up, we're looking at interactions um, all through this period. We're looking at interactions with their mother, but also it, uh, play, juvenile play behavior, interactions between the two, between their um, siblings. And then we'd also like to do some learning and memory tests with them. Um, and eventually, um, once they reach adulthood, we'll be collecting their brains. And my um, collaborator, Dylan, is going to be doing all of the cortical mapping. And my part of the project will be looking at some of these epigenetic markers um, in different parts of the cortex and the subcortex. So um, I'm interested, again, in the maternal behavior, but I don't have a ton of data on that just yet. And so I'll show you um, some of the developmental data that I've collected so far. Um, and uh, the, I think already you can, we can sort of see from these from these data, and this is, um, so far we have two um, litters each, we did not call the litters, so we've got litters of 14 um, in each, so we have 28 pups in one group and 14 pups in the other, um, but clearly we need to collect more litters, so this is preliminary. Um, but we uh, conducted a couple of tests to look at their locomotor abilities, so the gait analysis, we put them onto this piece of paper with um, a circle in the middle, and we looked to see um, at what, how, how long does it take for them to move off the circle? They get 30 seconds across multiple postnatal days. Um, and what we see here um, is not a whole lot of difference um, until uh, this point here, um, postnatal day nine, perhaps there's some differences emerging um, between the two groups, but this is not as robust as the other effects I'll show you. We also do the surface writing reflex, so we flip the pup over, um, and then let go of it, and you wait to see how long does it take for it to flip onto all fours. Um, and this is um, just looking at data from day two, so the pups get this pretty quickly, um, and so you really have to look early on. So when we look at day two, latency to write, what we see is that animals in the semi-natural condition um, actually take a lot longer to flip over than animals in the standard condition. And this is sort of consistent with a couple of developmental delays um, that I found actually quite surprising. So when we look at body weight, we see that animals in the um, standard condition are significantly um, heavier than animals in the uh, semi-natural condition across multiple postnatal uh, days. And uh, when we look at eye opening, even though this is uh, a slight, I mean, it's a, a small difference, but it's quite um, significant. Um, it seems as though animals in the semi-natural condition take a little bit longer to open their eyes. So what does the mothering behavior look like? As I said, this is um, preliminary because we have footage, we have data 24 hours a day for their entire um, post postnatal period. Um, but I'm just showing you here um, just days one and seven because this is all we've been able to code so far. So what stood out to me the most um, is that m usually what you see when you look at a laboratory rat is you see that initially on post day one, they spend a lot of time with pups and that the amount of time that they spend with pups um, decreases as the postnatal days increase. And we saw really a different sort of a pattern here emerging in the two groups. So this is the duration or the amount of time that they're spending on average out of the nest. Um, and we'll look at frequency in a second. And so what you see is the, the pattern I just explained with the standard um, group. Now, remember, this is only one mother, so I don't know. Um, I would imagine that this trend is going to keep up because this is what the literature would report for, for Sprague Dolly rat mothers. Um, but what we see here is they spend more time off the nest um, as the pups develop and become less dependent on them. But in the semi-natural condition, um, we actually see a different pattern starting to emerge. And when we look at frequency, um, we see this again. So, and this is in the dark phase and in the light phase, 
we just don't see a big change um, in what's happening between postnatal day one and postnatal day seven, unlike the uh, rat mother in the standard condition, which again has this sort of drop off in time spent with pups. Um, and so this is, these are all very preliminary, but kind of exciting, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to coding more of this and seeing where this, where this goes. Um, I think that although there have been quite a few experiments looking at wild rats in laboratory settings, there have been very few experiments looking at um, laboratory rats in, in semi-natural conditions. So hopefully this will, from this, we'll get a lot of interesting information. So um, with that, I just want to thank everybody who's been involved in this work. So um, the members of my lab have worked really hard on this, uh, particularly on the rat work, um, and my collaborators um, and uh, my former mentors. Uh, Jacqueline Stevens did a lot of the mouse work. She was a student that worked with me during my postdoc. Um, and of course, my funding and all of you for your attention. Anybody have any questions? Oh. Uh, so uh, this is really interesting uh, work, and I really like the introduction you've given to the epigenetics of, of maternal care. It's not something I knew about before. So um, the, one of the interesting questions for me is, is uh, okay, so phylogenetically, when did this uh, arise? Do we have evidence, perhaps, that early mammals also have this mechanism? I mean, can we see it, for instance, in Monodelphus domestica? Is an obvious question. The mechanism in terms of um, the maternal experience, or the the, the, the way that the maternal experience uh, the, uh, triggers uh, by this epigenetic mechanism uh, the maternal care behavior. That's an excellent question, and um, I I don't know um, I don't know of of anyone else who's looked at anything like this in any other species actually. Um, okay. And so I mean we we know a lot about maternal experience in terms of behavior. In the rat in the rat work, um, in terms of the epigenetic mechanisms, to my knowledge, this this is the only thing that's been done is, is the mouse stuff. So, are you planning to look at the uh, opossum? Uh, yeah, I like to. I mean, I I think that the the opossum is a really interesting model, particularly because the infants are so um, so altricial. I mean, really. Yeah. So, I think that would be really interesting to look at. I also know that they're quite aggressive um, in terms of protecting their young. If that if that's right. Uh, I just want to mm. add a note. In terms of maternal care, it's going to be a little bit different because the Monodelphus domestica, the, the, the babies crawl out and attach to the nipple, so maternal care is just like walking around and they're dragging all over the place. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, you have to see it. It's pretty uh, outstanding. But at, w at the point they start going off the nipple, they do retreat. So you're going to have this mm. different time lag, and there's going to be a lot more postnatal experience yeah. of the mother having... I mean, I think it'd be a really cool. Yeah, I think it would be cool. Comparison. And but do they show fe do they show maternal aggression? Do you know? Because I, I yes, I, I mean they, they they can. I mean Jimmy would probably know more about their behavior than me since he's in the in the lab more often than I am. But but they also show cannibalism. Yeah. In the lab. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but what about? <laughs> yeah. The <laughs> well, I, I would say that they are. They're t not very social animals, so they're always relatively aggressive, but they are a little bit more aggressive s immediately surrounding the birth, but otherwise yeah. are just normal. Aggressive. Interesting to look at that early on and then pup retrieval once the pups and, detached. And when Leah says that they're just dragging around, this is actually, it's a pouchless marsupial, so they are literally <laughs> dragging <laughs> their babies around. So. <laughs> Uh, it looks like the, the, a bus, and they're all getting on the bus yeah. and <laughs> traveling around on it. And like you say, they're, they're not a social animal, so for this animal that, that doesn't like to be around others to then suddenly have to look after these others, you can imagine there has to be some circuit mm -hmm. that gets switched on that really changes the behavior. Yes. Yeah. They, def they definitely do display pup retrieval, though. That's yeah. something that, you know, when we change the cages and everything, we know it, so it'd be very yeah. possible. Yeah. Yeah, that would be really, yeah, I would like it. Would and in terms of, of, of how this mechanism might come about, you can imagine that so maternal behaviors are so costly to the mother that you don't want to do that with just any casual encounter with a pup. So it's got to be 
uh, a bunch of pups that are probably yours, you get a whole lot of experience mm -hmm. with them, and mm -hmm. then, okay, I'm going to look after these yeah. guys from now on. Yeah, I but think that's a really good what's point. What's a bit surprising is that it's not built in that after you know the, the end of the natural period of maternal care that that would switch off again, because... You know, once you've been turned into a mother, then you might wander around adopting other people's kids. You know. Well, I think I think for the at least for the rats, um, you know, I, I think a lot of this has to do with preparing them for their next litter because the you know they're reproducing as much as they possibly can. So they have that, and and for the mice too, they have that postpartum diastrus, um, and you know, ideally they get pregnant during that postpartum diastrus. So when they are weaning, they're also about to give birth to their next litter, and so um, I don't know if they would sort of encounter random pups in, in a real life sort of situation. And so I think the mechanism is probably there for you know, easy transition from one litter to the next litter and getting sort of better at caring for your pups as you go along. So there was a very interesting uh, comment about the, the body weight um, yes. and the developmental stages. And um, about 10, 15 years ago, Anna Horder Sobedison in my lab uh, measured um, pups and grouped them accordingly mm -hmm. and noticed that uh, you can have about two to four days differences in the appearance of the barrel field mm -hmm. cytoarchitectonically just based on the body weight within the same litter. So uh, so is what was the difference? Is it less body weight sooner? Uh, so or ex no, no, much later. Li so actually, so, so if you have, haven't got enough body weight, then you can have maybe two to four days you know, delay mm. in forming the, mm -hmm. the, the barrel field. Yeah, that's really interesting. That would be interesting to look at, see. Actually, a different time point. S so what I would like to get back to is sort of the model you propose on the neural substrate mm -hmm. to regulate these behaviors, right? Because in some sense, you, you localize in a single nucleus of the hypothalamus, and that you conceptualize in some sense as a single cell, where you say, well, there's some G-protein coupled receptor, Mm -hmm. And that then sort of modulates gene transcription, and suddenly you're a mother, right? But now, if you if you look at other kinds of stereotyped behaviors, mm -hmm. like sexual behaviors, mm -hmm. and you look at the work of people like Hans uh, as of Pfaff, for instance, mm -hmm. right? Dan Pfaff, um, then it's clear we look at the, at least in his interpretation mm -hmm. for the regulation of sexual behaviors, another type of stereotype. Behavior. You look at the circuit, right? Just the hypothalamus interacting with. The central gray, mm -hmm. for instance, in other uh, brainstem areas, yeah. uh, superior colliculus might be involved. Mm -hmm. You might even ha touch, let's say, amygdala and so on. So it's, it's a circuit phenomenon, yes. right? So, yeah. so uh, th th there are two issues here then. Do you really believe it's so strictly localized? And if no, what's then the circuit that is really regulating the behavior that we're studying? Yeah, th uh, that's an excellent question. And um, I, I believe that it is a circuit, first of all. I, I do think that the mediopraptic area is playing a really critical role in this circuit. Um, but the, the only reason that I didn't show you any other data is because at the moment I haven't found any gene changes um, in, in the other parts of the circuit. But um, the circuit simplified is really the medial preoptic area projecting to the ventral tegmental area and activating the mesolimbic dopamine system. And my graduate work was actually focused on the mesolimbic dopamine system exclusively. Um, and Allison Fleming has done excellent work with maternal memory in rats, looking at changes that occur in the nucleus accumbens. Um, and so we know that oxytocin is important in the nucleus accumbens for this maternal memory effect. Um, but I haven't found any changes in oxytocin receptor in the nucleus accumbens or dopamine receptor in the nucleus accumbens. All the sort of targets that I would think would change, um, I just haven't seen yet. And so. Um, I certainly think there are changes, and I think there's probably a strengthening of that connection between the medial preoptic area and the ventral tegmental area. So it's sort of allowing that dopamine um, release in the, into the accumbens to happen more easily or with less inputs than what would happen uh, earlier on. But right now, I just don't have evidence for to support well, wait, that. This means mm -hmm. that, in some sense, aren't you then confirming Tony's Kissinger uh, hypothesis? earlier that was looking at this more that this is a switch, right? That this is a switch that enables the rest of the circuit to really learn about maternal behavior and to learn about, let's say, the context to which they occur and so on. This is just your learning switch, and that's why this is talking to the VTA. So you can exploit your, your, your dopamine signal now to, to actually form these memories and extract the rules of maternal behavior. So I then it's a switch. I think that... Yeah, I do agree with you, but I also think that there's some dialing up and dialing down of it. So maybe it's a, 
a knob. That's fine. That's fine. It's a dimmer switch. <laughs> I can live with it. Okay. <laughs> Um, we get to go to, I, I'm starving. I want to go to yeah. lunch. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Very much.